Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hi, I'm Anju Kagal and today I'm going to be discussing worms, more worms and some more worms. So today we'll be doing an, a study of intestinal parasites which are pathogenic to man and we'll start with the nematodes. Now in the kingdom Animalia, you have a subkingdom called Metazoa in which in the phylum Nemathelminths, you have a class called nematodes. In the nematoda class, you have the intestinal species, the intestinal and tissue species and the blood tissue species. Today we are going to be discussing the intestinal species in which we have Enterobius vermicularis, Trichuris trichura, Ascaris lumbricoids, Necata americanus, Ankylostoma duodenale, and strongyloid stercoralis. So, in the nematodes, let us look at their general characteristics. Morphologically, these are cylindrical, unsegmented worms which taper at both ends. They possess a body cavity with a complete alimentary canal. They are dioecious, that is, they have separate sexes. The posterior end of the male curves ventrally and the males are smaller than the females. Reproduction of these intestinal nematodes can be oviparous, in which case they deposit eggs. It may be viviparous, where only a larval form is seen or they may be ovoviviparous, that is that the eggs are laid and hatch immediately as is seen with strongyloids stercoralis. So now, uh, you know, remembering the life cycles of all these worms is usually very complicated. So I have tried to break it down into a simpler form. There are worms which have a direct cycle. What do we mean by direct cycle? That is the embryonated eggs are passed in the feces, they hatch and reinfect within 2 to 3 hours through the mouth and these are the worms which usually lie in the large intestine. And the two worms which are known to have a direct cycle are E. vermicularis and Trichuris trichura. So basically they are ingested, pass through the intestine, the eggs are laid and the eggs are again ingested. Then we have something called a modified direct cycle. This is seen with Ascaris lumbricoids which is also referred to as round worm. Now here the eggs are passed in the stool. There is a period of development in the soil, after which the eggs are ing ingested through contaminated water or food. The larvae which are released are released in the small intestine and from here they migrate in the body and come back into the small intestine where they mature into adults and the eggs are laid again. So, all right. so, instead of just coming in through the mouth and coming out through the anus, here this worm has been a little naughty and gone to other parts of the body. The third form is the indirect form. Here the eggs are found in the soil, these develop into larvae. The larvae also undergo some development and one form of the larva which is called the filary form larva penetrates the skin and enters the body of the host and it travels through the body and finally reaches the intestine. Now this is seen in the case of the two hookworms that is Necata americanus and Ankylostoma duodenale and it is also seen in the case of Strongyloids stercoralis. 
So, in this lecture we are going to restrict ourselves to three worms that is round worm, whip worm and thread worm. So, let us look at the morphology of Ascaris lumbricoids adult worm. The female is longer than the male about 20 to 25 centimeters in length. In fact, it looks like an earthworm. Very often you will have a patient coming to you and saying he passed something which looked like an earthworm in the stool. The female also has a distinct valvular waist. So, easy to remember we always talk about women's waistlines and so the female here is taller than the male and has a narrow waist. The male on the other hand is about 15 to 20 centimeters in length smaller than the female and has a coiled posterior end. These worms adult worms are found in the small intestine. Coming to the morphology of the eggs, the eggs of Ascaris lumbricoids are about 40 to 60 micron in size. They are bile stained which means that they acquire a kind of yellowish brownish color when you look at them in a wet film. They have an outer albuminous coat within which is the egg shell and right in the center is the ovum which may be unsegmented. A non fertile egg appears like this, it is elongated and you cannot differentiate the egg shell, the albuminous coat and the unsegmented ovum. Now, a non fertile egg you would find in a person who has got infected with an egg which has hatched into a female and there is no male over there to fertilize the female. So, let us look at the life cycle of Ascaris. Now, before I go on to showing you a slide, I would like you to just shut your eyes and imagine the path that a round worm takes. So, let us start with a human being ingesting a fertilized egg of Ascaris. All right. So now, when you when the person ingests the egg, it enters the stomach, where the gastric acidity causes some damage to the outer shell. After which, the egg moves on into the small intestine. Over here this little lava comes out. Now, I want you to just imagine a cute looking lava who comes out, you know how babies are always cute. So, there is this cute little lava which comes out and he is really shocked and surprised with all the sounds that are going around, around him. So, there is peristalsis occurring. So, you constantly hearing this whoosh, whoosh. So, it gets very scared and as soon as it comes out of the eggshell, it runs and where do you think it will go and hide? In the crypts of the small intestine. So, when it goes into the crypts of the long small intestine, it now starts feeling the noise has lessened, he has gone further in and then he starts going deeper and deeper you know because this seems to be a safe haven. And as he goes deeper and deeper, you find that suddenly he comes into a blood vessel. All right. Now, here he is swimming with the vessel and feeling very happy, too hot it was, too hot it was in the intestine. So, now he has come into the portal circulation. From here, he just goes with the flow and gets carried to the liver and from there to the lungs. By now, our lava has become a little mature, little older. So, what do teens do? All of you at this age, what will you all like to do? You all would like to go hiking. So, this teenage lava which is lying in the lungs, in the alveoli of the lungs, it breaks through and enters the trachea. It is going for a hike remember. So, it starts climbing and going right up the trachea. Now, when it reaches the top of the trachea, just like all of you all do, when you reach the top of the hill, what do you do? You look at the other side. All right. So, this fellow is leaning over and looking at the other side and before he knows, he leant too much and slipped into the esophagus. From here, 
again with the peristalsis he lands up in the stomach where there is too much acid he does not like it and so he goes back into the small intestine by which time he has become a mature adult all right. So, now let us look at a picture of what I asked you all to visualize. So, we have got the adult worm which is living in the lumen of the small intestine. A female lays approximately 2 lakh eggs per day. Can you imagine that is a large number? Now, these eggs are passed with the feces and like I told you there may be unfertilized eggs or they may be fertilized eggs depending on whether there was only a female uh, or whether there was a male and a female. And of course, in the case where there is only a male there will be no eggs. So, this fertile egg becomes infective about 3 weeks after it has lived in the soil. This of course, depends on the environmental condition it needs to have a moist warm shaded soil. Once it un undergoes maturation and it is ingested by the human host with contaminated food and water. Then it enters goes through the stomach into the intestine where the larva hatches. And here you have your larva looking very surprised and then to avoid all that sound he is gone and burrowed himself through the intestinal villi and the next thing is that it is in he is in the portal circulation swimming along with the blood cells. So, once it enters the work, uh, portal circulation then it enters the systemic circulation into the lungs. It matures in the lungs where it takes about 10 to 14 days. And of course, during that time it is causing some damage to the tissue around that area. From here it penetrates the alveolar walls, enters the bronchial tree, goes up the trachea through the on top of the trachea it is swallowed and then the adult is back in the small intestine. Here it develops into the adult worm. So, 8 to 10 weeks are required from the time of ingestion of the infective egg, eggs to oviposition by the adult female. That is after a host has ingested the egg it will take about 2 to 2 and a half months before the adult female can produce eggs. And if this adult worm has not gotten rid of it can live for up to 1 to 2 years in the host's intestine. So, ascariasis the disease affects all ages usually children 5 to 10 years of age. There is no intermediate or reservoir host. The lifespan of the adult is 1 to 2 years. The female lays about 2 lakh, two lakh eggs per day. The unsegmented eggs undergo development in the soil for up to 3 weeks after which they are infective. And the time from ingestion of the egg to oviposition is 8 to 10 weeks. So, let us look at the pathology and clinical features. So, now whenever you are studying worms there are two ways there are one of the ways of looking at the diseases caused by the worm is to see which forms of the worm are present in the body. So, now in the case of Ascaris we have got this naughty lava which seems to travel in the body. So, when it goes into the lungs it will cause Loeffler's pneumonia all right. Now, this Loeffler's pneumonia is characterized by fever a non productive cough and occurs 4 to 15 days after ingestion. The x-ray will show infiltrates in the lung and the patient will also have eosinophilia which will last for about 3 weeks. Visceral larva migrants is a rare condition when the larva instead of going into the lungs decides to enter the brain and sometimes even the retina. And when it goes to these stage places it is like the end stage of the larva 
it will cause small areas of necrosis, there will be eosinophils at the site, but beyond that it does not mature. Due to the adult worm, there can be various actions. If of course, you have got just a single worm, you may not have any of these problems. You will be asymptomatic, but in case you have got more worms, then the most common feature is foliative, ac it is foliative action. The direct effects due to the worm, toxic action and effect due to wandering worms. So, let us look at the spoliative action. Now, this is usually seen in children, young children who have got a massive infection of roundworms. It will rob the host of proteins. In an adult, it may not be so noticeable, but in children it precipitates quashiocor and it also leads to a vitamin A deficiency and night blindness. So, this is a child who has got quashiocor as a result of roundworms. And when this child was operated, this is the number of worms they took out from his, from her intestine. Direct effects. Now, when the worms are very few, usually you have no symptoms. But when the, the infection is heavy, then there may be intestinal colic, there may be volvulus. Intestinal obstruction, which is usually seen at the ileocecal junction, and this usually occurs in children less than 5 years of age who have got a heavy infestation. And in some cases, the child may also get intersusception. Sometimes the worm may find its way to a maybe pre existing ulcer and cause perforation. It can go and block the appendix leading to acute appendicitis. Sometimes it can enter the hepatobiliary tra tract causing an obstructive jaundice. It can also reach the pancreas, the pancreatic duct when it blocks the pancreatic duct. It can lead to pancreatitis. In the gallbladder, it can cause an acalculus cholecystitis. When it reaches the liver, it can lead to an hepatic abscess and very often when the worm load is very high, the child may vomit and when he vomits, he will bring out the worms in his vomitus. Very rarely, the adult worm can block the trachea and cause death. The toxic action due to adult worms is as a result of a toxin called ascarion, which can lead to urticaria and this is especially seen when the larvae are present in the lungs and sometimes patients may present with asthma. Okay, how are we going to diagnose a roundworm infestation? The first thing would be to do a gross examination of the stool. You could do microscopy. You can demonstrate eosinophilia by doing a peripheral blood smear. Imaging techniques and ultrasonography can also be used to detect the presence of these worms. In gross examination, you would look for the adult worms. And as I mentioned before, the female worm is about 20 to 25 centimeters in length. All right. Can you imagine that 20 to 25? Imagine a ruler, a one foot ruler. All right. So, the female is 20 to 25 centimeters, the male is 15 to 20 centimeters. So, almost half to three fourth of the length of a one foot ruler. Stool examination is done by doing what we call a saline and iodine preparation. This has been covered in your introduction to parasitology. Here we take the stool sample, place it in saline and in iodine, which is then covered with a cover slip and looked at under the microscope. 
if you see fertilized eggs it means both male and female are present unfertilized eggs if only a female is present and no eggs if only a male is present sometimes it may so happen that the clinician feels that this child definitely has a roundworm infection but you haven't been able to find the ova in the stool in such cases we can resort to what we call concentration methods and in the case of ascaris we usually use flotation methods so these are just some pictures of the round worm on the upper left corner is a ovum which is which uh, is embryonated on the upper right side you can also see the development of the larva within the ova on the lower side you see an unfertilized and a fertilized egg so this is the unfertilized egg and on the right side you see what we call a decorticated egg where the albuminous coat has been uh, removed all right so these are the various pictures this is how the ova will appear in a stool examination eosinophilia is a condition in roundworm infestation which is usually seen when the when the larva are present in the lungs all right it can also be seen on other stages but it is more prominent during the larval migration the eosinophil the eosinophils are about 5 to 10% but can be as high as 30 to 50% again depending on the worm load a plain x ray of the abdomen in heavy infestation may demonstrate the presence of a large collect collection of worms which can be seen contrasting with the gas in the bowels however if there are less worms you will not in a plain x ray you will not be able to visualize the worms if a barium meal is performed then the worms may appear as elongated filling defects and if they are taken a little later after the barium has passed you would be able to visualize the worms appearing as strings because the worms would have ingested the barium so there'll be a thin thread bisecting the length of the worm's body so on the right side you can see elongated filling defects which demonstrate the presence of round worms in the bowel of this individual ultrasound is usually done for diagnosing hepatobiliary or pancreatic ascariasis now when a patient has hepatobiliary or pancreatic uh, ascariasis the patient will also have a colicky pain you have to remember that single worms bundles of worms or even a pseudo tumor like appearance can be seen on ultrasound on prolonged scanning sometimes you'll even be able to see the worms showing a curling movement treatment of ascariasis is done with mebendazole or albendazole these two are the drugs of choice and are usually given in a single dose however they are contraindicated in pregnancy and in heavy infections because what happens is that when you give them in a heavy infect infestation it is likely that it can lead to intestinal obstruction pyrental palmoate or piperazine citrate can also be given to patients piperazine citrate has the advantage that the drug paralyzes the worm and aids in its expulsion the newer drug which can be given is levomazole but by far uh, mebendazole and albendazole are enough to get rid of the worm prevention good sanitation and personal hygiene so you have to be careful that you always if you're going to be consuming raw vegetables make sure that they are 
washed properly. They have to be really thoroughly washed at least two to three times before you think of ingesting them. Farmers need to be educated not to use human feces as fertilizers. And of course, we are trying to build toilets all over in the country, in the villages, so that people do not have to defecate in the open. Soil treatments have been attempted, but aren't very practical. How many areas are you going to go and take care of? So that is why we do not resort to soil treatment, but we prevent open air defecation and educate farmers not to use human feces as fertilizer. Mass treatment is one of the common ways of treating. So if you have in a particular family or in a particular area in the village, you are finding children with roundworm infection, then you should give a single dose of mebendazole or albendazole. This may be given to all school age children in that area and it can be repeated every three to four months. This serves dual functions. One, it treats the children and secondly, it reduces the overall worm burden in that community. So now that we have finished with roundworm, we will now move on to Trichuris trichuria, whipworm or Enterobius vermicularis. Now if you remember, these two were the worms which had a direct cycle. So I do not think I need to make you imagine how these worms are going to travel in the body like I did with roundworm. So let us start with Trichuris tichura. This worm is also called a whip worm. The adult worm is about 4 centimeters in length. The female is longer than the male. And as you will look in the picture on your right, these worms have a thicker area and a long whip like thinner region. And therefore, it is called a whip worm. The thicker part could be the handle of the whip and the thinner part is the whip part. The eggs are 60 micron in size. They are bile stained, barrel shaped with mucus plugs at each pole. They are unsegmented. So this is the morphology of the whip worm, adult worm as well as the ova. The infective form of whipworm is a mature embryonated egg and mode of transmission is ingestion and the site of localization is in the cecum and ascending colon, unlike the roundworm which lives in the small intestine. So let us look at the life cycle of Trichuris trichura or whipworm. We will start with the, uh, the embryonated eggs which are passed in the feces. Uh, these uh, will, if the soil and the environment is suitable, these will mature into, embryo, into eggs which have undergone cleavages and have formed a larva. Now this whole thing from the uh, excretion of the egg in the feces to its development to an infective form takes 15 to 30 days. When man ingests the eggs, the larvae are hatched in the small intestine. Now this larva is a good boy, does not go wandering anywhere and just goes straight down to the cecum and where it matures into the adult worm. Now this adult worm will either lie in the cecum or it may at the most go into the ascending colon. The lifespan of an adult worm is up to one year and the female can lay 3000 to 20,000 eggs per day. So that is a large number of eggs, some of which may be embryonated and some may not be embryonated. The clinical features of trichura, trichuris trichura, the disease is called trichuriasis. 
symptoms depend upon the worm burden. If there are less than 10 worms, the patient would be asymptomatic. In the case of heavier infections, the patient may have a chronic profuse mucus and bloody diarrhea with abdominal pain. Sometimes when the worm load is really high, these worms find their way to the rectum and when they are present in very, very large numbers, they can even cause edema of the rectum and rectal prolapse. This is usually seen in patients who are immunocompromised. Now due to the presence of this worm, besides the other symptoms which I have mentioned, there can be malnutrition, weight loss and anemia. This is a picture of trichuris trichuria in the large intestine. As you can see, many worms are present. Their anterior end is embedded in the intestinal mucosa and this has resulted in erythema. The adult worm is almost never found in the stool unless like it is a case of rectal prolapse. This is a picture of an adult worm which has been removed during colonoscopy. So, you can see what the worm, why it is called a whip worm. Laboratory diagnosis is done by stool examination. You want to look for bile stain eggs with a bipolar mucus club plugs and therefore, whenever you want to look for bile stained eggs, you usually do it in a saline preparation because you can appreciate the yellowish brown color. Whereas, when you are looking at it in an iodine preparation, the iodine may interfere with your interpretation. A treatment of treatment and prevention of whipworm infection. A treatment is done with a single dose of albendazole or mebendazole and prevention is by proper disposal of night soil and washing of uncooked vegetables and fruits before consumption. So, we have now completed two worms, roundworm and whipworm. Roundworm which had an indirect cycle and whipworm which has a direct cycle. We will now study Entrobius vermicularis also referred to as threadworm or pinworm. The adult worms, the male is about 2 to 5 millimeters and the female is 8 to 13 millimeters in length. The female has a posterior pointed end which looks like a pin, hence the name pinworm. It is also called seat worm because it tends to produce symptoms near the anus. It is also called thread worm because it looks like a thread. The ova are plano -con convex, they are non bile stained about 60 micron in size and may show a coiled embryo. The infective form is the embryonated egg mode of transmission is by ingestion or auto infection and the site of localization is in the large intestine, especially the cecum and appendix. Let us look at the life cycle of E. vermicularis. So, we have the embryonated eggs which are laid by the gravid female in the perianal region. So, what happens is that the male will fertilize the female, the male dies after he fertilizes the female. The female will move down, go down to the rectal region, to the anus and at night deposit eggs in the perianal region after which it dies. The embryonated egg now becomes infective in 4 to 5 hours. Now, there are two cycles that this embryonated egg can take. One is that it is dif distributed in the environment. It may be present on the bed linen, clothing it, through which it can get airborne or it may be present under the fingernails. Now, it gets 
it is found under the fing fingernails because when the female gravid female is laying the eggs in the anal region perianal region the child will have uh, severe pruritus all right so now these infective e eggs which are found in the environment may get ingested or inhaled the larvae will hatch in the small intestine from where they migrate and the adults live in the cecum and the ascending colon. So, direct cycle no problem remembering this life cycle. Now, I mentioned that there is a second way of infection one is in ingestion or inhalation and the other is that when the embryonated egg becomes infective the larva may sometimes hatch near the anus and migrate up the host digestive tract and then go back into the cecum and mature into the adult worm. This is termed as auto infection. The clinical features of this disease are perianal, perineal and sometimes vaginal itching which worsens at night. The child may have insomnia, restlessness and very often the child may have nocturnal enuresis. Rarely the child may present with urinary tract infection or abdominal pain. Now, I keep referring to child this can also cause infection in adults, but in children it is more common that is why I keep saying child. So, this is a picture in the anus showing pin worms. Laboratory diagnosis means uh, the way to demonstrate the presence of this worm is by doing a gross examination of the stool, but usually the worms you may not find in the stool all right. Usually you will find them in the perianal region. Now, when do you find them in the perianal region and this is usually at night all right. So, if a child is complaining of pruritus or is suffering from insomnia or is getting nocturnal enuresis, you make sure that you will examine the child's anal region at night, maybe when the child is sleeping. Now, if you manage to spot the female worm, the next thing to do is to pick it up and how are you going to do that? You could do it with the help of what we call an NIH swab that is basically a glass rod which has cellophane at the end of it which is attached with rubber band. But nowadays the simpler method is to use scotch tape or cello tape. You take this tape wind it around as you can see in this picture on maybe an ice cream stick. Then touch it to the perianal region and after that remove it from the stick and stick it onto a slide. And of course, ensure that you wash your hands well after you have done this procedure. You can then look at this slide under the microscope and you will look for non bile stained plano convex eggs which will show the presence of larvae in many of them. If you are lucky to have picked up a female worm and that you have you stuck it onto the slide, you will be able to see the worm with the eggs within its body cavity. Treatment again albendazole, mebendazole or pyrantal palm weight, single dose or you can give it twice a day for 3 days that is mebendazole is given 100 milligram twice a day for 3 days, but most important you need to repeat after 2 through 3 week, weeks, because that time the remaining worms may come forward to lay more eggs. Treatment should involve treating all the household contacts and immediate friends. Prevention 
you must insist that the child wash his hands with warm water and soap after using the toilet. The fingernails should be kept short and clean. And if any child is complaining about pruritus ani, then in these children, you must ensure that the moment they get up, you make them wash their hands. And you could also do one more thing and that is make them wear gloves before they go to sleep. Showering daily is also very important. Change underwear and clothing daily and launder the bedding, clothes, towels which may contain pinworms with hot water. Drying these clothes in sunlight also helps get rid of the worms. So we have come to the end of three of the intestinal nematodes. We covered roundworm we did whipworm and we did pinworm. I hope you benefited from this lecture. Thank you.